Dr. Steve Kantrowitz, the Planer Baskin Professor of History here at UW-Madison. Steve, take it away. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Lane Wyndham to you. Lane uh, got her uh, uh, BA from uh, uh, Duke University and her PhD from the University of Maryland, spent many years as a labor organizer and is currently the Associate Director of Georgetown University's Kalmanovitz in Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor. She's also the co-director of Will Empower, Wom Women Innovating Labor Leadership. She is also the author of the award-winning Knocking on Labor's Door, Union Organizing in the 1970s and the Roots of a New Economic Divide. Uh, and I just wanna say a few words about this book. It, it, it won the David Montgomery Award from the Organization of American Historians and the Labor and Working Class History Association in 2018. And that award is really significant. It's named after the Dean of American Labor History. It's the most important award in that field. And in, it's part of a, a chorus of appreciation for the work. Uh, and I just need to quote for a little bit here from Michael Honey's review of the book in the American Historical Review. Uh, because it so perfectly captures what's so special about this work. He says, Wyndham helps us under better understand how the challenge of working class organizing was beaten back and beaten down by a coordinated assault from business and the right. The book provides sharp insight into the nature and depth of the problems we now face in trying to provide income and health care for the many. Wyndham's account should provide a strong compass for the direction of labor studies for many years to come. And if you heard her talk yesterday on labor organizing in the 1970s, you have some sense of what he means. Today, she's promised to help us understand where, US, where the work, US workers movement is heading today in a talk entitled Workers Control in Gig America, uh, the title of which is a nice shout out to the title of a book of essays by David Montgomery himself. Like Wyndham, Montgomery began his career as a labor organizer before turning to history to make sense of laborers' struggles. And if he were still with us, I know he'd be eager to hear what she has to say. And I honestly don't know a higher compliment than that. It's a great pleasure to introduce my old friend, Dr. Lane Wyndham. Thank you, Steve. That's a really nice introduction. I am uh, thrilled to be here with you all today. Thanks to the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice again for having me for the second day. You know, we had a really good conversation yesterday and I'm looking forward to that again. I'm gonna be talking about what I think is happening today in the workers movement. And I hope that you all weigh in and that we really have a discussion with you bringing your experiences too, uh, because I'm sure there's a wealth of that here. So I am gonna uh, seamlessly pull us up uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. And then we'd have to do, how do we do slideshow from beginning? All right, there we go. Um, okay, so today's talk, Workers Control in Gig America, as Steve mentioned, the title of course reminds us of David Montgomery's masterful workers control in America. Uh, Montgomery wrote about how working people battled for power during a critical time of the formation of industrial capitalism before there were effective state checks on capital. We're in a period today when working people are once again battling for power in a changing capitalism. There's lots of names that people give the capitalism today, you know, global capitalism, financial capitalism, data capitalism, I like that one. I've also, also heard the term surveillance capitalism. And I like that because it puts it sort of more from the, work, the worker's perspective who's being surveilled. Whatever we decide to call it, the question I wanna explore today is how can working people build power and security in today's capitalism? And I find that this question is the one that keeps coming up whenever I talk about my book. It's this sort of big unanswered question sort of the next logical step after you follow the revised historical narrative that I put forward uh, about labor's decline and knocking on labor's door. Uh, so spoiler alert, I don't, I don't have the full answer to that. Um, what I wanna do today is talk you through my own thinking, the questions and issues that I've been thinking about 
And to do that, I'm actually gonna do something I've not done before, which is I'm gonna take you through my journey as a union organizer and how I've come to think about that experience and think about the assumptions that were underneath sort of what we were doing as we were organizing um, and, and sort of my ideas on how the larger meaning of that work has developed over the years. Um, so first, a quick recap of yesterday's talk. There are maybe a few people with us today who weren't with us yesterday. It sets us up also for today's conversation. So we talked about how union organizing came to be the doorway to the US's employer provided social welfare system. We discussed how the 1964 Civil Rights Act created a newly diversified working class and women and people of color led a new wave of union organizing in the 1970s, but were blocked by employers uh, who, who blocked them uh, by breaking and bending weak labor law. The end result is that America's working class faced a new century and a new capitalism in a much weaker state. There were far, far fewer unions than there might have been if workers had won this blue collar battle and the unions that remained were less reflective of the newly diversified working class than they might have been. Okay. So I wanna take a moment to reemphasize one key point that we talked about. Why did employers fight unions so fiercely starting in the 1970s? In part, it was because of the particular role that unions play in the US's employer-based social welfare system. In the US, much of our social welfare, uh, our healthcare, our pensions, even our sort of base living wages, it, it comes through our employers but our country mostly never required employers to provide this. Um, all we required is that employers engage in collective bargaining with the workers who did everything it takes to form a union in this country. And so unionized, uh, unionized employers collective bargaining came to set the standards for wages and benefits. And collective bargaining and unions played an unseen role is a kind of cornerstone of what effectively functioned as the mid 20th century social welfare system. When employers faced a crisis of profit within a globalizing economy, they really wanted to get out of this whole thing. They didn't want to provide social welfare anymore. The best way out, attack the one entity that legally can force you to play that role, which is unions and collective bargaining. So employers didn't just attack unions, they began to shed that whole social welfare role. They began to stop providing healthcare and pensions. They hired more temporary workers and contract workers. Eventually, this has evolved what we call today the gig economy, what I'm calling gig America, in which employers have basically rewritten the entire employment relationship and have attempted to jettison that role of social provider entirely. When employers attacked unions and union organizing, they didn't only hurt labor, they weakened the whole social compact because that whole thing was a collective bargaining was a cornerstone of that. Um, so how can working people build power while trying to operate from the wreckage of this old system? Um, I think that working people need structural change in order to build power and security in gig America. And in order to sort of talk about what I mean by that and how I came to that conclusion and help to help us unpack some of these assumptions, I'll talk about my experience as a union organizer in the 1990s with a union called the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, or Act Two, uh, in the South. Okay, so my first experience as a lead organizer was at a place called McClenny Products in Florida in 1993, and I was 24. McClenny, Florida was a tiny town halfway between Jacksonville and the Okefenokee Swamp. You can see my high tech graphic here. The other large employer in the area was the state's third largest prison. Uh, and this is, if you, if I showed you the whole map of Florida, this was like dead in the middle of red, sort of Republican Florida, right? It definitely was a red area. The company, McClenney Products Inc. or MPI, was a cutting shop that helped make men's suits. The workers there would cut the fabric and it was then shipped to the Dominican Republic to be sewn. 
and then returned to MPI in Florida to be tagged and finished. It was what was known as an 807 cutting shop because section 807 of the tariff code allows companies to evade duty taxes on overseas manufacture if some part of the garment was made in the US. The parent company was based in Pennsylvania where the main manufacturing plant already had a union. So I arrived there in 1993 to talk with Christy Wilkerson and her father's job was to hang telephone lines for a living. And he was part of the union, the CWA, the Communications Workers of America. So she'd actually called his union. They passed her name on to us, the Act Two. So Christy was wild and brave and funny. Uh, when I first pulled up in front of her single wide trailer and she was sitting out on the front steps, smoking while her school-age kids were running around the yard. And her first reaction was basically, you know, hey, what, what took you so long? Um, and she soon introduced me to Vernon Davis. Uh, now he was a veteran who had, he'd seen other parts of the world than Northern Florida. And he was charismatic and a natural leader. And he was also super cautious. He did not trust me me. Uh, so I visited him once and twice. And I finally, on the third visit, I knew we were getting somewhere when I walked in the living room and he had, you know, a bunch of other people there waiting for me. Um, that crowd, however, was all white. Um, and the plant was about 20% African-American. McClenney was in a very racist part of the state. When another group of African-American union members from the Levi Strauss plant in Valdosta, Georgia came down to visit and talk with the workers. Those workers from Valdosta would not stay the night. <laughs> they would not stay there. All the town officials were white, even the beauty key queens and the Christmas parade were white, you know. So I reached out to, at, I think Vernon and Christy told me to reach out to Archie Mae Richardson. And Miss Richardson, she, she was, the elder in our group, and she really organized African American community to support the union. Some did so out front, some chose to do so behind the scenes. Um, the workers there wanted a union because, as we've discussed, the best way to access the most secure tier of the nation's employer provided social welfare system, right? You need a collective bargaining agreement. The union job is a good job. The, the pay at MPI was low. The average pay was $5 an hour. Uh, the minimum wage at the time was $4.35. They were paid by the piece and rates were very low. Healthcare was too expensive. The pension was basically non-existent. A big issue was the point system. Basically workers would receive like these demerit points whenever they missed work or if they missed mandatory overtime, which they often got on less than a day's notice. The workforce was about 75% females, there was lots of caretaking duties at home. So these points were like a huge issue. Also workers wanted a, a voice on the job. You know, America's workplaces of course are incredibly undemocratic spaces. The scholar Elizabeth Anderson calls uh, our workplaces uh, private government because our nation's system of at-will employment grants employers such sweeping power. Employees essentially cede all their rights to the employers except those explicitly granted by law. So when the, you see the words here, respect, or maybe a say, that was how people would say that they wanted, you know, that voice, more democracy on the job. Um, so we went through the whole process you go through to have a board election. First, the workers signed cards. A lot, a lot of them did it at home, away from the work where the boss couldn't see them. Uh, when enough had indicated they wanted a union, we took the cards to Jacksonville to the labor board office and they scheduled an election for December 10th. Meanwhile, the company hired a well-known union buster, Jackson Lewis out of Atlanta. Uh, and the company began to run a massive campaign against the unions. They began pulling workers into mandatory captive audience meetings at least once a week and often more where the workers often were not even allowed to speak. The supervisors singled out workers, pressured them to vote no. 
um, these leaflets, they don't look very sophisticated and that's in part because they were trying to make them look homegrown like they were from a local, you know, like the local committee. My favorite is the one on the left, stop and watch the union and it's slick saleswoman very carefully. <laughs> We talked yesterday about how globalization wasn't a natural process, uh, that companies used it as a weapon to counter workers' organizing efforts. So at MPI, where workers knew that other workers in the Dominican Republic sewed the suits that they processed, globalization was a big threat. And so MPI passed out a leaflet. I don't have it anymore, but they, they, they passed out a leaflet that featured a Florida unemployment form, and it read, this is filled out by people who lose their jobs. And it ended with, at McClinney, our employees are working compared to many in the apparel industry. We are fortunate. And they did fire people. Um, so Arnold Clayton uh, here on the left one day reacted to the heightened tension that was in the plant. And he took a stand, he took a box and he made a homemade sign and uh, put it around like looped it around his neck and the sign said, stop slavery at McClinney products, vote yes, December 10th. So the, his supervisor made him take off the sign. So then he, off his body. And so then he hung it on the wall and they fired him for refusal to follow company policy. They cr cut Christy Wilkerson's pay by a dollar. Everybody knew Christy was the one that had called the union. The day before the vote, um, the president of the whole company, uh, he was New York based, he, he said he came and had a meeting with them and his words were, we set up McClinney as a non-union facility. If that flexibility ceases to exist, McClinney ceases to exist, period. That's all there is to it. Well, surely this is illegal, right? Didn't we try to stop it? Yes, yes, we did. We filed lots of charges, but the process is extremely slow and would not be reconciled before the election. Even if the company had been found guilty, there's no fines, there's no penalties. The most that would happen is the company would have to hang a blue and white sign in the break room saying it had broken the law and perhaps rehire the workers and pay, the wa pay them the wages they had lost. The day of the vote was very dramatic. They fired another woman. Uh, this this uh, another person, Robin, uh, on the right here, on the day of the election, they fired her that day because she had been absent for several days after her mother had a heart attack. And they fired her when she went up to get her ballot to vote and said, oh no, you don't work here anymore. Vernon Davis had donated a kidney to his father the week before the vote and he rolled in on a wheelchair to cast his vote. 124 people were eligible to vote. There were some challenge ballots on both sides. Uh, the board agent, once the workers had finished voting, dumps out the ballots and begins to count them. The vote was 58 for the union and 56 against. Uh, the challenges would be determinative. So the whole thing got hung up in, in court. So a long story short, the union knew that the labor law was really broken. So they ended up going outside the agency to the federal courts and they sued for relief. On July 25th, 1994, nearly a year later, a federal judge issued a landmark decision that ordered MPI to negotiate with the workers. It was the first interim bargaining order ever issued by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And the company did bargain. And the workers did get a contract that addressed the points, it addressed the pay. So they didn't get everything they wanted, but they got a lot. Hey, the workers won, won. Then the company in the early 2000s closed. Um, and I can't find out exactly when, but it was, you know, right, it was after China's entry uh, uh, into. Uh, most favored nation status. There were a series of layoffs. Uh, all the workers in McClinney are laid off by 2004. And frankly, this is very typical. Every single company that I helped organize in the 1990s closed by the early 2000s. And there are big campaigns, Toltecs in Martinsville, Virginia, Fieldcrest Cannon in Kannapolis, North Carolina. 
big campaigns, huge victories, all the effort, the heartbreak, right? I just showed you one, one campaign. There were like dozens of these, right? All gone. The workers didn't have a job. They didn't have a union because the union itself, of course, is based on the workers having a collective bargaining agreement. So everything we built was gone within a decade. Even when workers won under the old system and won a contract that covered wages, healthcare, and pensions after this kind of long, heated, protracted fight, you know, you can make a movie out of, out of this campaign, um, and they won a better deal and the employer provided social welfare fair system, they still ended up losing because the whole system rested on capitalism structures. When capital moved, the worker system of security and their democratic union was automatically destroyed. So eventually I moved on to the AFL-CIO headquarters in Washington, DC. And there I fought for legislation like the Employee Free Choice Act, which would strengthen labor law. And I also fought for fair trade policies that wouldn't so easily undermine workers. And frankly, like none of that worked either. <laughs> I mean, we didn't win any of, the, of those fights. So here we are with a new democratic administration about to take office with a deeply divided nation. And we're faced with this question that I raised at the beginning of the talk. How can we possibly build power and security for working people in today's capitalism? And I think we're at a point where we have to rethink some of the assumptions that undergirded and ultimately perhaps undermined the current labor law system and, and its organizations. I think that, um, that it, it's not enough just to fix the current system. Um, it's not enough to just make it easier for people like those at McClenny Products to form a union. I think we have to rethink the fundamentals and that's a big long-term battle. So what are some of those assumptions that were underneath the labor law system that I used when I organized at McClenny Products? Um, that system assumes that there are certain items of the employer provided social welfare system that are permissive subjects for bargaining, like health care, pensions, and wages. The best way to improve these was through collective bargaining. Meanwhile, it assumes that other items of social welfare, like housing, education costs, clean air, right? These are not subject to discussion in this system. Uh, this system, it assumes it, that it's enterprise-based, meaning that there's one contract and one employer. Even though at McClenney Products, there were two facilities unionized in different states, those would be separate contracts. There were no set standards in the men's suit industry. Other countries have what's called sectoral bargaining in which entire sectors negotiate wage levels overseen by the government. This system was also based on a static understanding of the employer. Workers are hired by one employer. They're not temps, they're not independent contractors, they're employees. Um, there were some temps that worked at MPI, but they were not part of the bargaining unit. They didn't vote, they were outside the contract and it's, its whole employer provided social welfare. Um, that's problematic today, right? When one in 10 workers, as many as one in 10 workers uh, work as independent contractors uh, or about 15 million workers. Uh, as we discussed, there was a lot of racism in the larger McClenney community. Uh, those, my, the Valdosta union members were scared to spend the night, but racism was not a subject that the union understood was at the core of its mission. That's not to say that unions don't deal with racism, they do. But the collective bargaining agreement uh, and was the focus of the union. Uh, and they understood that racism in the community was outside the plant walls. So it wasn't really in the union's purview. The system assumed that the only way to be a union member was, was to work and have a job at MPI. That's, and, and you have to go through all these hoops to get a collective bargaining agreement. No collective bargaining agreement, no union member, right? So, uh, you know, if you didn't actually get a union contract all of this, you wouldn't count in those Bureau of Labor Statistics tallies that they do every year on union membership. When the plant closed, 
these workers were no longer union members. Um, and so, you know, some of you might be thinking, yes, that's apparel and textile, though. We all know all those jobs left. It's really what she's describing is very specific to that industry. But I just had a very similar conversation about union membership with a number of young union organizers and the Unite Here Union, which represents hospitality workers. The coronavirus has wiped out that industry. That union lost 90% of its membership overnight. If people don't have jobs, they don't have union contracts. And then in our current system, they are not union members. Um, now, Unite Here, to its credit, just turned down a ton of its, you might say, former members in Arizona and Nevada. It is a political powerhouse, but you can see the power of uh, the progressive left that the unions bring. Uh, and that is all threatened because when those workers lose their jobs, that whole institution is threatened. Okay, people know that the system is built on employment and that they are deeply beholden to their employers. It gives employers huge power over people's lives. It ties people's interests up with their bosses. Imagine how much less of a threat employers could be if people knew they could get health care, pensions, and even a base wage, even if they were fired. It's a fundamental flaw in the system. Um, the system assumes you have a job covered by labor law. Uh, this is a problem in that many, many people, especially women, many people of color, are far more likely to hold the kinds of jobs that are still not covered by labor law, like maybe housekeeping or agriculture, uh, childcare, unpaid uh, and paid. And as I've tried to make very clear, the system rests on workers' ability to navigate a broken labor law system in which employers have effectively closed off workers' access to unions through bending and breaking weak labor law. So it's just like so hard to get through the narrow doorway into the system. At the end of the day, all these limitations means that a very tiny group of workers meet all the multiple criteria and have jumped through all the hoops that allow them to be union members and to be covered by the most secure tier of the employer provided social welfare system or to have a union agreement, right? So about 11% or 6% in the private sector, which is about the same rate as in 1900. Um, not only that, but those union members can only bargain over certain subjects that impact their lives, wages and specific benefits. And they have shrinking bargaining power uh, because they don't have a real right to strike or to exercise collective power. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the, what they're even, the bargaining power itself has also greatly weakened. It's not that people don't want unions. Uh, the most recent Gallup polling, which I think I have here, yeah. The most recent Gallup polling shows a 65% approval rating for unions. You've, this is the Gallup polling from 1940 to 2020. Uh, so we're at a 65% approval rating and nearly half of the workers who don't have a union say they'd join one tomorrow if given the chance. Uh, but, uh, you know, they can't get them for so many reasons. And even if they do get them, they're very narrowly defined in the scope of the work that they do. Okay, so back to this question, how can workers build power and security? How can workers build power from this sort of wrecked system of labor law uh, and address the new challenges of today's economy, especially during a pandemic and at a weak political position? So I understand that there are three approaches uh, that, it, that I'm gonna put a, what I see happening in today's workers' movement into three buckets uh, just to organize it. Um, and uh, these three buckets, these three approaches exist simultaneously. They are not in sequence, they are not in a hierarchy. They are, in fact, they are interdependent. Um, okay, uh, so, so the, the three pieces are fixed labor law, the second is rethink unions and collective bargaining, and the third is new social compact. Okay, so the first approach is to fix labor law and to shore up the existing system. 
Uh, the PRO Act, Protecting the Right to Organize Act, has passed the House. Um, it would provide stronger and swifter remedies when companies violate workers' rights, prohibit captive audience meetings like those ones my workers sat through in McClinney, override so-called right to work laws, prohibit companies from permanently replacing strikers that would help rebuild bargaining power, and tightens the definitions of independent contractors so that more people are eligible for unionization. But of course, this still doesn't address some of the core issues. It still defines union membership by employment, meaning the company can still close, the workers lose their jobs, and then, then they aren't union members. It also doesn't deal with the non-permissible bargaining subjects that impact workers' lives, like housing and climate. Workers still have to jump through a ton of hoops to get a union and, and bargaining, even if the hoops are slightly larger. And the whole thing is still based on enterprise bargaining, one employer, one group of workers. Um, nevertheless, fixing labor law uh, and updating it uh, would, would go a long way to ensuring that, that more workers would at least have uh, what was intended when the Wagner Act was passed in 1935. The second set of approaches are gonna be what I call rethinking unions and collective bargaining. They build on and expand the current bargaining system to have far greater reach and power. Um, and the first uh, sort of subset here uh, is the effort called bargaining for the common good, which is an extremely popular approach. I listened to Stephanie Luce's talk a few weeks ago, and she also talked about bargaining for the common good. Uh, it has a lot of momentum in the movement right now. This approach was pioneered by public sector workers, especially teachers, and it expands traditional collective bargaining to include members of the public and community stakeholders. It reimagines the kinds of subjects that can be tackled through collective bargaining to include issues that are core community concerns. So for instance, teachers in St. Paul were pioneers of this approach. They literally invited the community to sit at their bargaining table. They asked the community to help them set the demands for bargaining. And over, they've done this through, through a number of contract cycles now, but things that they've bargained over are class sizes, more nurses, even restorative justice issues in the schools. Um, in February of, of this year, 2020, over 4,000 unionized janitors working at high-rise towers in Minneapolis, uh, members of SEIU Local 26 went on strike, demanding improvements in wages and working conditions, but also that their employers take action on climate change. They worked with partners from Minnesota Youth Climate Strike, Environment Minnesota, and other environmentalists. And the union presented a set of climate justice demands to the commercial building owners that they worked for. These demands included the creation of an owner and community green table, closure of a local incinerator, and adoption of the union's proposed green, green clean training program. Okay, so they didn't win everything. They did not close the incinerator, although they started the discussion on that. They did win better wages and they won a new education fund like on that green clean training and a commitment to discuss issues like worker safety, better chemicals, reducing waste uh, and um, energy at a reformed labor management committee. So, uh, so I think that bargaining for the common good has a lot of promise. Um, there are other ways that people are rethinking unions and collective bargaining. Another solution is, that's getting a lot of attention is sectoral bargaining, like I mentioned before. This is where tripartite committees set industry standards. Sectoral bargaining is the norm in many European countries. And you know, a lot of people say, you know, oh, the Europeans, like that's great, that's Sweden or whatever, that's never gonna happen here. That's impossible. But legal scholar Kate Andreas has written about how we actually had a form of sectoral bargaining that developed alongside the Wagner Act and labor law. The 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act set up tripartite industry committees of unions, business, and the public to set minimum wages on an industry by industry basis. And these functioned for about 10 years. So if anybody's interested, I would, um, 
suggest uh, checking on Kate Andreas's research. Some of this can be advanced at a state level, a particularly interesting approach given the federal gridlock. So for instance, Cuomo in New York set up a fast food wage board in 2015 that set a schedule to raise all fast food workers wages to $15 an hour by July of 2021. So it can be at the local level. Uh, another rethinking solution would be to allow workers to have a union without of half of them having to vote for it. These are called minority unions or works councils. They would require an amendment to labor law. Uh, you could require bargaining at a much lower threshold, like 25%. So a lot of these solutions are laid out in Harvard Labor and Work Life's Clean Slate program, you can look that up. We have a bunch of solutions that are kind of like this. Um, and I think it's, it's some very innovative thinking. So the third set of approaches that again must work simultaneously with the first two, um, new labor law and the rethinking. Uh, this third set of approaches are universal worker benefits, basically a, a whole new social compact. COVID-19 has made clear that I think that the time is really right for a new social contact. When tens of millions of people can lose their job, why are we still forcing people to rely on employers for health care and pensions and an income floor, right? Uh, so uh, we can build a social safety net that is largely unhitched from the employment relationship. Well, how can we do this possibly in the current gridlock? Ironically, we've already made progress under Trump. We can build on precedents set during the pandemic, like the $1,200 stimulus payment or the mandated paid sick leaves when the family's first coronavirus response act, right? Federal man mandated paid sick leave. Um, so there are already some precedents. Ultimately, of course, it means universal health care, robust retirement security through the state, affordable housing, quality child care, a minimum income guarantee. In the recent elections, we saw this trend play out in a number of ways. In some cases, there was an expansion of universal benefits at the state level. In Florida, an amendment to raise the minimum wage to uh, $10 an hour by 2021, and then $15 an hour later. It's one at 61%, right, in Florida, the state that Trump lost. Um, in Colorado, there was an expansion of the social safety net. For the first time, a state passed a ballot measure for paid family leave. Proposition 118 allows for 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave funded through a payroll tax paid by employers and employees in a 50-50 split. And of course, uh, there was in California, uh, we saw a, a, a further weakening of the employment relationship without uh, an expansion of universal benefits. In California, in Prop 22, it declared app drivers to be independent contractors, not employees. This was passed after a massive campaign by Uber and Lyft. It is very unclear to me what people thought they were voting for. Maybe there is someone on this call from California who can help us understand this a little bit more. I do know this was the most expensive ballot initiative in state, the state's history. I think this is an, another example of how the employers have long been trying to exit the employer provided social welfare system and why we need a more universal systems that, that workers can build and can control. So finally, as part of this discussion on this third bucket, uh, uh, the new social compact, I would conclude by characterizing what, how I understand today's labor movement. And really, I like to call it the workers' movement, because increasingly working people are organizing in a new kind of workers' movement that combines traditional unions with organizing and that builds worker power beyond the weakened collective bargaining system. Women and immigrants lead these worker centers, women of color especially, these public wage campaigns, these occupational based organizations like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Restaurant Opportunity Centers, New York Taxi Workers Alliance. These groups make creative use of public opinion, wage and hour laws, community organizing uh, to rebuild workers' economic security, even within big America, within the 
21st century workplace. Um, without ever engaging in collective bargaining, New York restaurant workers have won sick days. Massachusetts domestic workers have won a bill of rights guaranteeing overtime pay and fair treatment. Uh, and when I think about, you know, the workers from McLennan, I often wonder if they had had some of this third bucket of solution, solutions, these universal benefits, these new organizational structures, what a difference that might have made for them. Uh, they wouldn't have lost their union when they lost their union contract if maybe they could have had one of these new organizational forms. And of course, if they had universal benefits, the, the, when their employer closed, it wouldn't have been so incredibly devastating in their lives. Um, you know, uh, the election made clear that the nation is really divided politically, and I don't know whether the big changes are likely to come through federal policy change, but I think that the pandemic may provide some opening for progress, and it's something I'm watching very closely. I do hope that we approach this moment with a revised narrative about how we got here. It is not that working people turned away from unions and that unions missed the rights revolutions of the 60s and 70s. In fact, a diversified working class tried to form unions and enter the most secure of the nation's employer provided social welfare system, but were blocked by employer activism. America's working class remains very diverse, very active. I'm thinking of the Red for Ed movement, the largest wave of strikes that we saw in 2019 since 1983. Young people are very interested in organizing. I think that we can't keep judging workers' actions based on last century's measurements. Workers lost the battle to have large numbers of people enter unions through the board system, through existing labor law. Employers won. Um, but it's important to envision and fight for new structures that support working people within a transformed capitalism. Um, and some of these hybrid solutions that re-envision unions and collective bargaining and a new social compact, I think offer a lot of promise. Okay, so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, right. Right. Well, then thank we you can have a much. discussion. Yeah, so uh, just to explain to those people who have not participated in any of our, our um, Zoom calls up to, till this point, um, what, the way we're gonna proceed is as follows. So we're gonna take three questions at a time and then turn it over to Elaine to respond. But the way in, there's two ways in which you can raise a question or make a comment, one of which, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu. Uh, the fourth item, in, uh, item from the left is participants. And if you click on that, you can find an option to raise your hand. That'll alert me that you want to ask a question or make a comment. The other way is through the chat function, the thing immediately to the right of that participants function. And already I have two people. Um, and if there's a third uh, or more, you can get lined up. So let's start with Mike Goodman, uh, who I'm going to ask to unmute. Uh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, my question is this. I mean, you're correct that this is a serious problem that no one can belong to a union unless they have a job first. That's why I'm wondering, why have organizations, labor organizations like the IWW not taken advantage of the fact that they have a wholly different philosophy where you can be a member of the IWW without having a specific job in a specific uh, location? I would think that uh, that type of arrangement would be tailor-made for organizing workers that either have lost their jobs or are unemployed to begin with. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And I have a question from um, Jen, who asks, could you please speak to the future generation of workers who, for one thing, will be switching jobs at a more frequent rate, thus possibly weakening organizing strength? Um, so, uh, Anybody else want to ask a question or make a comment? 
otherwise we can go to Lane. Um, all right, here's one from Joanne. Joanne asks, can we realistically expect to move healthcare out, the mar out of the marketplace? Um, may help with power and security. Okay, so those are your first three questions. In the meantime, people can line up for additional ones for the next round. Okay. Um, so uh, these are some great questions and I don't have all the answers, but I'll give my thoughts. Um, this, this discussion that we are having and the questions you all are asking, I feel like it's very exciting to me because this is where I feel like um, the movement needs to be. These are the kinds of discussions that need to be happening over and over in lots of places. So I'm thrilled that just to discuss these issues with you. So Mike, uh, yeah, I can't speak for the wobblies. Um, you know, everybody should want to be a wobbly. I don't know why you know, they, aren't, they aren't just pouring in there. Um, but I do know, I can say that in the 1970s, there was, or actually in the 1980s, there was an effort uh, when unions tried to deal with um, the, are you done, sweetie? <laughs> okay. <laughs> when unions tried to deal with the downturn in organizing that we talked to yesterday, um, they began to wrestle, think like, can we build organizations that people could just join and not have to be part of collective bargaining. Um, and uh, a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about that. They studied it, but it was torpedoed by a number of the unions who were very wary of it and who felt like, oh, they didn't wanna, they didn't wanna risk that all those people would have voting power within their union, right? They didn't want to, um, they worried about um, basically, yeah, like sort of that expanding in that way might actually mean giving up some kind of power. And so um, while uh, there were some unions that, for instance, wanted there to be a way to be part of the movement, part of the AFL-CIO in a broad way, um, most unions uh, did not ever choose to have that kind of what they call associate membership. Some did, like the AFT does. Uh, and not only that, but those unions blocked the AFL-CIO from being able to build that kind of associate membership. Eventually they did with the group called Working America, but that was 20, 25 years after that original effort. Um, and I do cover part of that in Knocking on Labor's Duel. Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, so Jen's question, the, the young workers, that's right, who uh, are switching jobs all the time, how will they build organizing strength? Well, this gets to this question that, um, that I think we have to rethink worker organizations. I think that uh, we kind of, it's, it's kind of like we have two classes. We think of, oh, well, unions that are based on collective bargaining, and then there's all these other organizations that are in some other silo. But I think we have to think about um, that th th those organizations might work together. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, one model uh, is the kind of union like the guilds. Like when you think about like the Screen Actors Guild or the entertainment unions, those, that is the gig economy, right? Those people go, they work on one movie and then they go work on another movie or one Broadway show and then another Broadway show. And they have a whole system where they basically have portable benef benefits and they've built up a master contract over the years. Um, and so it, it could be, right, that we could look to the guild model um, as something to develop in the future. Um, and it also could be that we build organizations that are more occupationally based, like the Taxi Workers Alliance, the Domestic Workers Alliance, where you join an organization because of the work you do and try to build power that way, and you don't necessarily organize workplace by workplace. But you're right, people are constantly moving jobs. Um, and then um, healthcare, right? I mean, Joanne, you uh, you raise a really good question on healthcare. Um, can we, we actually, 
I'm sorry, she actually added a little bit to that after I, Oh. I, if you don't mind. Is there something in the chat? Yeah, so to, it was to me. Uh, so oh. she says, some of the criticisms of the Democratic Party are poor marketing and poor communication, which helps socialistic concepts sound like communism. In addition, Republican constituents call their elected officials 17 times more than Democrats. Again, weakens labor's, laborers efforts. Anyway. Right. You know, I mean, I think the, the union movement has um, has an issue in terms of uh, where it's going to go on health care. There are some unions like the nurses union that are adamantly for universal, universal health care. There are other unions who uh, people might not know this, but Taft, what, what are called Taft-Hartley plans uh, actually are, are union company plans they developed out of the Taft-Hartley Act. And they actually provide health care and pensions uh, to, to members. And so there are a number of unions whose very organizations are tied up into the employer provided health care system. And so it's like a real um, identity crisis for unions to let go of that system. Um, and some are more willing than others. I think that in order to uh, break the stranglehold that employers have over working people, that that should be a major fight for universal health care, that that is not just a like a general fight. I think that that needs to be a major part of labor and working people's fight um, because the employers just have so much power over people. Um, so, uh, but can we do that? Um, I think that the pandemic has certainly shown people uh, how incredibly difficult it is to have that health care tied to employment. I mean, million, tens of millions, right, of people lost their jobs in an instant and they lost their health care. Okay, I have several questions. Um, I'll take three of them now. One comes from Nikki Mandel. Uh, she writes, in the early 20th century, some social reformers, especially women, argued for regulatory laws versus unions because they would benefit all or more workers. Is this similar to your argument today? And then I have a question from uh, Naomi Williams. I'm gonna ask you to unmute and then activate your camera. Go ahead, Naomi. Thank you, Lane. Uh, I appreciate these two talks back to back. It's been really great to kind of revive this conversation that we've been having for I don't know how many oh, yeah. years at this point, right? <laughs> um, I, I have a comment, though, because you mentioned um, Jackson Lewis as the uh, strike breaking law firm. And that's actually the law firm that my employer has hired to go after us um, at Rutgers University. And, and Go into your, you know, your third tier of what to do. Um, our collection of unions, right? We have formed a coalition. So I, I think it's 19, maybe 20 unions at Rutgers University who are working together and really trying to center the most vulnerable workers on campus. Really, you know, it started with um, late, massive layoffs in the dining halls and in part-time lecturers, what some, some uh, universities call adjunct lecturers. Uh, so really trying to, and it's been a complicated, right, tension field <laughs> uh, months of trying to do this work. And it really requires unions to educate their members. And, you know, thankfully we, you know, we just started in the faculty union, our, a freedom school, so that we can really do some of this political education work and, and really convince, um, especially tenure stream faculty for the need to really center um, the most vulnerable faculty members on campus to, to kind of do this work. And, uh, you know, I, it's sort of like the bargaining for the common good too, right? Bringing in neighborhood groups and organizations, for example, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, we have a student, you know, there's a school, right? That the university has, is attempting to kick these uh, elementary school students out of the building and transport them across town to turn into a parking lot. 
And so, you know, we're working with the, uh, it's the, called the Lincoln Annex School. We're working with the families, right, to save the school so the students can continue their education there, not have to be bused across town. Um, and I bring all of these things up to say that in this moment, and part of it is the opportunity of the pandemic. I mean, we, we have no choice but to change and we can't go back to some thing that we call normal. We have to continue to push and to move and you know, follow the example of Unite Here, right? Over 90% of their members are unemployed and they had, you know, they had to step up and say, okay, what are we gonna do about healthcare? What are we gonna do about this? You know, are we gonna get involved in the election? And they're knocking on more doors than the Democratic Party leading up to the election. And, you know, so we have to, we have to be creative. And so it's not a question. It, it's, a, it's a long series of comments about different things. But I didn't want to go back to that whole Jackson Lewis and what that looks like today. Yeah, they're, they're evil. <laughs> okay. um, and the third question comes from Bruce Nissen. Uh, again, I'm asking you to unmute. And you can go ahead and activate your camera. Hi, um, I want I want to say I thought you've categorized kind of the three main thrusts of the way people are trying are trying to revive power for working people in the labor movement. I thought it was very very good. They're good uh, categorizations which help us to think these things through. But one thing you didn't say here, and I didn't read your book, so I, I can't say any your writings, but what, what, you didn't talk here at all about something that seems important to me because I've been hammering on these points for years, just these ideas that you've been talking about in the three thrusts for quite a while and things. But it seems like what's holding us back is in order to win any of these things in large measure, we need a broader change in the whole political understanding and almost, I'd almost say cultural, but definitely certainly political understanding of, and, and a, a very heavy shift to the left in our political system um, to achieve any of these three, particularly the first and the third, but I think even also probably the second. And that's gonna depend on not only I think the labor movement, but other outside forces and stuff. And so I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on that larger <clears throat> transition politically, it's gonna be necessary and attempts to do that, for example, things like the Democratic Socialists of America or other attempts to try to transform the entire political system well to the left so they can win all of these things you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. And so there's your three questions. Um, happy to see there are other people lined up. So Nikki, thank you so much for raising that issue. Um, and um, so, um, I very much see those sort of three buckets that I talked about, the um, labor reform, right? That would basically allow people to enter into what we think of as traditional unions, um, as well as the rethinking the unions and then the more universal, like the, the laws that would affect everybody. I see all those things happening sort of simultaneously. I don't see it as an either or. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and so I see that, that unions as part of their, you know, fighting for the common good would fight not only for their collective bargaining agreements, uh, but also be part of these more universal struggles. But you're right that this tension is certainly a long one um, uh, in, the, in our system. And thanks for raising it. Um, and, you know, Naomi, thank you for that discussion. I mean, you have a whole other story that you can talk about, about what happened, you know, in, in Madison too. I mean, you know, there's, I mean, all, a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have a discussion about that. Um, you know, I, I love that you all have created schools and you're calling them freedom schools. Uh, I think that uh, one uh, piece that our movement, every movement, every viable movement has always had a, an education piece. Um, and that was true of the populist, it's true of the civil rights movement, uh, women's movement had consciousness raising sessions. And I believe that the 
labor movement and the workers movement has dropped that and we are not doing the level of education that we need to be doing and have not done it for a number of years. Um, and uh, so I'm thrilled that you all are, have freedom schools and that you are calling it that. Um, so Bruce, I know, right? Like, how do we do this when, uh, you know, this, if anything, this election uh, was, showed how deeply divided this nation is. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I am still trying to make sense of this election. It is really hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that 70 million or some odd, seven, about 70 million people actively voted for Donald Trump. What does that mean? Um, and, uh, you know, I really had hoped for a bigger margin for the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, and even as I was, you know, excited when they, you know, won Pennsylvania and it was clear Biden and Harris had won, I, I couldn't kind of get past that. Um, and then I started feeling like, you know, nobody, nobody ever said this was gonna be easy, right? Uh, and people, you know, the struggles, there are long, long, long struggles and we are just, we are in the middle of it. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's, it's just that we have to really think big and think about and talk about what are the long-term structural changes we wanna see? We need to start talking about a new social compact. That's something that is the European movements talk about a lot more than we do here. I think we have to stop thinking about what Biden can do in the first hundred days. I mean, not stop. It's great, you know, what he can do in the first hundred days. But the bigger issue is like, what are the what are the bigger structures that we want, and envision them, and make that part of our movement? Um, because yeah, it's it 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 is going to take political change and cultural change, and and that's a long struggle, and we're all part of it. Okay, I've got more questions. So first from Edward Poe, um, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and activate your camera. Okay, I, I, I don't see how I act, activate my camera. That's all right, you will be capturing your voice at least. Hear my question. I don't know if uh, guild and trade are the same thing, but I was just, I, I know when I was younger, uh, if you were a plumber, in order to work, you had to be a member of the plumbers union or a member of electrician, electricians union, et cetera. And it's not directly related to an employer, a particular employer, because you could work for various people. So I'm, I'm wondering if that, if that would be a, a model that every type of work would have a, a, a union that in, in order for you to work in that particular trade, you would have to be a member of a union. And that way the unions would be much stronger than, uh, than they could be if you were organizing just individual company to, to worker. All right, the next question comes from A. Cochran. Could you say where the Ghent system, where benefits are tied to union membership, e.g. unemployment insurance fits in? Is Ghent similar to our employer provided benefit welfare state or is it a new social compact model? It apparently encourages union membership. And the third question comes from Alexis, who asks, how can union organizers today attract the younger generations? And what role does the younger generations do, uh, play in strengthening the labor movement? Okay. Okay, um, so Edward's question, uh, yes, so that's right. The, when we think about the guild, the guild models, we think of the entertainment uh, unions and also the construction trades. And so um, the, if you're a plumber or an electrician, et cetera, et cetera, you go through uh, a training system, an apprenticeship system where you learn the job um, and then uh, have that union card. And then, um, you know, you have the right to work the jobs that are unionized. 
the weakness to that system is that, I mean, how many people have had their roofs put on their house or had a plumber come to your house? And they didn't, those people don't have a union card, right? The, I mean, maybe a few of them do, but most don't, right? The, the way that um, we have kept up demand for unionized trades is largely a function of the state weighing in. So uh, this, you know, the federal government or various states require that contractors uh, pay a prevailing wage, often that they use unionized labor. Um, and so that creates a demand for unionized plumbers or unionized roofers. It's almost all on commercial uh, buildings. And so it is fundamentally limited. And even then, there's a lot of commercial building that is, is not unionized. Um, so um, I think that the guild model is certainly one that um, is one that we can think about. But I think that in order to get employers to agree to use unionized labor and to have contracts, you would have to have the state power in order to have some kind of enforcement to that, uh, which kind of gets back to the question that, that Bruce was raising. Um, but it is helpful to remember that we have multiple models. Um, you know, uh, hiring halls is another model. Uh, you know, the, the long term and still use that where people show up at the union hall and, and, and get hired from there. Um, so, um, I forget the person who asked about the Ghent system. I have A written down. <laughs> so the Ghent system, and I'm not an expert on this. My ex I work on US labor. Maybe there's somebody who can just describe it better. But the Ghent system, basically, uh, as I understand it, has unions play a role in the unemployment system, right? Here, we have a state-based unemployment system. It's at the state level where in every state, employers put in a certain amount of money and workers, you know, put in money or whatever, mostly employers into an unemployment fund. And then if, if workers are laid off, they can access this sort of state fund. There, it's administered, the unions uh, are basically uh, playing the role uh, that the the state plays and and they do it in conjunction with the state and so it's it's coming through unions and the labor system um, and so that does absolutely strengthen organized labor's hand within their social compact. Um, that's a very basic explanation and maybe somebody else can explain it better. But uh, the the point though is that you know in this country. We have have a very um, the very uh, employer based system. Uh, the state is still there, right? Because uh, people employers don't bargain with the union out of goodwill, right? They do it because the state tells them they have to. If the workers jump through all the hoops that they have to to get a union then you engage in collective bargaining and then you have to talk about wages and benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's how our system works. Um, in, in other countries, uh, the, the state is, is involved uh, at a much different level in their social compact. Um, and then Alexis's question on uh, the union organizing and, and young people. Um, young people, are showing a lot of interest in traditional unions. Um, and I think it was in 2018, there was a slight, um, a very slight uptick in union membership. Uh, and uh, analysts broke down who was organizing. And of all the new growth, uh, that you saw in the movement, because of course you have to grow a lot because a lot of times unions are also losing members because plants are closing or whatever. Almost all the new growth was among people um, 35 and under. I mean, it was just like massive numbers of young people were the, the ones most interested in organizing. And it was, it was a lot of the um, digital journalism so places like uh, 
um, vice, you know, uh, or, or uh, I can't even think of them all. You all can probably come up with them, but all the digital digital journalism, oh, there's been a lot of organizing there, as well as on um, the college campuses. Um, uh, Bill Herbert, who was on yesterday's call, just sent me a report that Cooney Hunter put out about uh, academic labor, and they have shown that in the last, you know, decade there have just there've been many, many uh, new graduate employees uh, unions that have been certified. I think about roughly twenty or so uh, in recent years, and that's that's a lot, especially since. Um, you know, the labor board and the private sector unions has, has said those workers don't have that right, yet they continue to organize. So I think there's a lot of interest among young people. Okay, um, the next one comes from Gay Seidman. I'm gonna ask you to unmute and to activate your camera. Hi, uh, thanks, Lane. That those were both really interesting lectures and beautifully done, thank you. But I want to ask a question that's partly based on my experience with this or watching the South African labor movement over years. I feel like your arguments about um, alternative structures, organizational structures have been around for a while. And I wondered what response you get from people working within unions because in South Africa, it's become really clear to me that the economic structure of unions that depend on members um, and the dependency for um, union officials on that income has tended to shape their priorities in ways that makes it very hard for them to imagine other organizing structures. And I kind of think I've seen similar things here. I, Steve Lerner is an old friend of mine and kind of what happened to him seems to reflect some of the resistance to the kind of organizational imagination that you're talking about. So yeah, so I wanna know what, what the, how people respond. Okay, thanks. Um, so we also have a question from Ben Blake who um, said he has a question in relation to labor education. He asks, have you heard any uh -oh. discussion? What happened? Um, have you heard any discussion about reopening the National Labor College? Um, I think that's all we have right now, unless somebody else wants to raise a question or make a comment. Maybe Edward. Power. Oh, okay. Ed wants to ask another question. Um, so again, I'll ask you to unmute Ed and go ahead. Okay, yeah, it's, not, it's really not another question. So follow up on your answer. I, I really appreciated that. But I remember when I was young, for instance, you were talking about private contractors. If a private contractor installed electricity or something like that, and there was a fire, uh, the person who, who employed that person would be fired if it wasn't a union member. So there, there, there are safeguards um, to uh, the, the, the competition between a union member and a, a private contractor. It's like, it's like a doctor, you, you, you practice, you cure somebody, but you're not a doctor, you could get thrown in jail for practicing without a license. So I was just wondering if that model, uh, if you incorporate more trades, would that protect the worker more than than, uh, than if it was uh, just a uh, employee-employer relationship. Okay, thanks, Ed. So there are your three questions. Great. Um, so Gay, I would love to, maybe this is a longer discussion at some point, I would love to learn about the South African movement and the alternative structures there, because um, I don't know much about that, um, and uh, so I, 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 I just don't know that world. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, so the, how? So, but what I do know in the U.S. how unions have responded to this new wave of worker organizations, um, and I, in my experience, um, unions very much consider. The, these new organizations that build power outside the realm of collective bargaining, they see them as in a very much a separate silo. It is really hard for people who uh, are within the movement to 
think about their organizations in a way that sort of upends the very core of it, which is that it's really built around these collective bargaining agreements. That's what union membership is built around. That's what union dues is built around. Um, and they, a lot of people are, I think, very resistant. Now, there have been partnerships, right? So uh, the AFL-CIO back in the 2007 or eight or something, uh, first started these um, charters where organizations like, um, I'm thinking of places like the National Domestic in the lawn, the National Domestic Laborers Organizing Network um, could get a charter and sort of be a, a sort of partner member of the AFL-CIO. Um, but nobody's really hit, I think, a really good um, model of, of how to um, build organizations at the same time. Now, interestingly, in my book, there is an example of nine to five, how they tried to do that in the 1970s. They first built nine to five as an organization that was outside collective bargaining. Boston clerical workers did things like issue reports and hold bad boss contests and lots of media work. And they built power in, in that way and, and suits. They also filed civil rights suits. And then they formed SEIU Local 9 to 5 and then SEIU District 9 to 5. And it, they worked these two models simultaneously. They did that, you know, through the 80s. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to see more of that, to see um, the, the, the unions and the, um, the sort of worker organizations trying to, to work more in sync. Um, but Unfortunately, we haven't seen a lot of, of that kind of level of, of partnership. Um, and, and a lot of the discussion that I have with people in the movement, in the labor organizations, they're also very dismissive. Um, they often will say, well, if you, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna get dues? How are you gonna, how are, how are you gonna get dues? You know, um, and that, uh, and it often sort of shuts down conversation, um, which I think is just, I think it's short-sighted um, because the, the model is, is awakening uh, and we have to find another way for workers to build power, maybe perhaps alongside the collective bargaining relationship. And I, I have not heard anybody say anything about reopening the, the labor college. I, I just, I don't even, maybe you have, but I haven't heard anybody say anything about that. Um, and then Ed, what I hear you saying, it, and I think it's an interesting, it's a very interesting question of like, is one way workers could build power is that their organizations can set standards in their industry, right? So that's exactly. not just in the trades, that could be among teachers, it could be among home health aides, it could be among um, the, you know, pretty much any industry that exactly. they would set the standards mm -hmm. uh, that that would be expected and that other people would follow. And I think that gets us back to the question of sort of the guilds and the trades and uh, what role those, those kinds of uh, industry organizations could play with workers. And I would love to see more people Experiment with that. There is some experimentation. There's the freelancers union, um, you know, uh, based out of New York City, uh, which is which is inter interesting. I think that the National Domestic Workers Alliance has approached this. They also have have standards, um, and they try to involve um, the families. So the the families of the people who the domestic workers are caring for often, like it may be in a long-term care situation. And they, rather than seeing the families as like, um, oh, they're the employer, they're the enemy, they're who we're working against. They are like, no, we're all caring for these elderly or for these children. Let's involve the families in making sure we're raising standards and maybe setting standards through the state. Um, uh, and that benefits everybody. And so I think 
domestic workers alliance and the caring across generations organization are definitely setting a, a, a new standard in today's labor movement on that. Okay, well, we, we have one more um, person lined up and I think we have time for one more question. And then okay. maybe um, you can also, after responding to it, offer some maybe concluding remarks if you have them. Um, so Kermit Lubby, uh, I mean, Hubby, excuse me. I'm gonna ask you to unmute and to activate your camera. Uh, I'm, I'm on a smartphone. I don't think I have bandwidth for the camera, sorry. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I, I appreciate everything. Hearing about the importance and value of unions. And I'm just gonna offer this con potentially contrarian uh, concern or observation as to uh, the possibility that there is a, an image or reputation problem regarding unions that's been planted in, well, I'll, I'll say my, my segment of the boomer generation. And that's based on just a variety of stories I had through high school, college, and even in my own employment of uh, union laborers telling these interns, slow down, don't do that, you can't do that, you know, gee, you're making us look bad. And it just makes me wonder, is there a decision maker problem? Is there, you know, whether it's uh, marketing or, or re-education, but I'm concerned that that may be a dynamic that's at play, you know. So anyways, I just throw that out for, you know, observation or comments. I'm, again, I'm not negating unions. I see the value, you know, everything historically, but at the same time, there were these experiences, anecdotes, I don't know about the research that undercut the value by raising concerns, so. Right, right, right. So, um, you know, I, uh, there's been a fair number of studies over the years on the benefits of unions, both to workers and to employers. Uh, unions, the economists will tell us unions raise wages for workers at least 15%. That's even after you control for uh, gender, race, jobs, occupation, et cetera, et cetera. So 15% across the board, it's even higher for women and people of color. For employers, um, the economists uh, have, a number of economists have shown how uh, unions actually by setting standards and also by, uh, for instance, uh, lowering rates of absenteeism, et cetera, can actually um, have a positive impact on productivity. So the discussion that you're raising, I think in some ways is a cultural one. Uh, and, and I think you acknowledged that at the beginning of your remarks, which is um, how we have been taught in many ways to see unions. Uh, and I think that's a reflection in part about the way the media has portrayed unions. It's very interesting to me that young people who have not been subject to the same kind of media blitz against unions that your generation was subjected to have a, a much more open view of unions um, and are much more open to the idea. So I definitely think there is something in the culture going on there. Um, which deserves further study, I think. So in terms of concluding remarks, I, I didn't really prepare any, but I will just say this, um, which is that I, you know, I've been involved in the labor movement for since 1992, I guess, for a, a long time. And I am more hopeful in this moment than I have been in years and years. For years, when I worked at the AFL-CIO, nobody there and in the media even said the word working class. They just didn't say it. The only time you saw somebody talk about the working class was when during political election time, right? And as we talked about yesterday, that they, they often were talking about white men when they, when they said it, right? 
uh, we have, uh, there has been really since I think the 2008 recession, frankly, uh, great recession, there has been um, a rethinking of the need to balance things out so that there's less inequality, so that workers have more power, that over corporations, corporations have undue power in our system. There's a realization of that. And I think that, um, that uh, you know, you've, you've seen a lot of support for, for instance, the Red for Ed strikes. A big difference between those teacher strikes, the ones we most recently had, and the ones that were in the 1970s and, and 80s, is today the teachers had the support of the public. They did not have it in the 70s and 80s. And that's a big difference. Um, and I uh, have even been, you know, uh, really heartened by the way that people have seen essential workers during the pandemic in a whole new way. Um, and I think that the challenge for the movement right now is that, it, it, as Naomi said, we have got to think creatively and think beyond the old uh, fights and the old structures because I do not think that the workers' movement is going to be able to recreate itself from sort of the wreckage of what the employers did to the system in the 70s and 80s. I think we have to uh, build, build forward, build um, in, in multiple on multiple fronts in a very creative way. And I'm excited because I do think it's happening. Um, and thank you all for being part of this conversation this is exactly the kind of conversation that needs to happen if working people are going to build power in this country. Well, thank you for taking the lead in, 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 in this conversation and for de devoting the last two days to us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, I just want to make, before everybody takes off, I want to make one more plug for our final speaker in our series, Craig Calhoun, University Professor of Social Sciences at Uni uh, Arizona State University, who will be giving a lecture titled Degenerations of Democracy, Double Movements Again and Again. That title sounds pr particularly apropos these days. So I hope that you'll join us for that. Encourage other people you know to do the same. A, a final reminder that today's talk was recorded uh, as was yesterday's and they will both be available on our website before too long. All right, thanks again, Lane. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, take care everyone.